So far in physics, we've really only worked with objects that move from place to place, and we've completely ignored objects that maybe sit still but spin or rotate. Um, we've done some circular motion stuff, but even with that, we thought about you know maybe a planet going around the sun. The planet is moving from place to place there. Uh, but, you know, what if we just have a, a wheel and, you know, it's not rolling across the ground, it's just you know, up in the air and we give it a spin and it rotates for a while and it slows down to a stop. Uh, you know, don't we have any, any way to analyze that? Well, sure we do. It turns out that... And it turns out that a lot of this is going to look really familiar to us uh, in terms of uh, the, the format for things. So we'll have... Uh, you know, things that cause changes in linear motion or translational motion, and things that cause changes in rotational motion. And we can do kinematics with linear motion, and we can do kinematics with rotational motion. So a lot of this won't really seem like it's new, except we're going to be using different units and different variables. But it is useful to kind of figure out, you know, how, how these things are going to look different. We'll start the same way we started linear motion, and that's describing the motion, in this case by using kinematics equations and kinematics quantities. So first, let's address the, uh, the terminology and the variables we're going to use here. First, we'll do a review of the stuff we did with linear motion, sometimes called translational motion, where something is moving from place to place. Uh, for position, in general, we used an X or a Y, and we broke that up into, uh, you know, horizontal and vertical motion, X and Y motion. Um, but, you know, generally, X or Y, and we measured that in meters. Um, and then with position, we could have a starting position and an ending position, so we might have had a subscript there to denote, you know, when we were looking at that, whether it's X or X naught or Y or Y naught, but X or Y for our variables. For velocity, we used a V, and that was in meters per second. And again, we could have uh, looked at velocity in the X direction or in the Y direction. We could have looked at initial velocity or final velocity, so we might have had some subscripts there, but they were all velocities. They were all Vs in meters per second. Acceleration, we did a lowercase a, and that was in meters per second squared. Could have been X direction or Y direction. And then time was just a lowercase t, and that's measured in seconds. Now, on to the angular side. Uh, instead of looking at how something has moved from place to place, we're going to look at how something has rotated, how many circles it's gone around, or how many times it's gone around, or uh, you know, maybe what angle it's rotated through. Um, and that's actually going to be the more typical way that we express this. And so our angular position, we're going to use, instead of an x or a y, we're going to use a theta. So if it rotates, say, 90 degrees, that's a quarter of the way around the circle, we could say our initial position is 0 and our final position is 90 degrees. Though we don't usually use degrees to describe angular position. Instead, we're typically going to use radians. For velocity, that was how position changes with respect to time. And so in the linear system, we did you know meters per second, how the x or the y changed with respect to time. Now we're going to look at how the angle changes with respect to time. So it's going to be, uh, or how the, the angular position changes with respect to time. The variable we're going to use for this is a Greek letter omega. Looks like kind of an extra curvy uh, W here. Um, and then the units on this are going to be not radians, not meters per second like we had in linear motion, but radians per second. So if, for example, we had something moving with an angular velocity of 2 pi radians per second, 2 pi radians is 360 degrees, or it's one time around a circle, 2 pi radians per second would mean that this thing is rotating once every second. On to acceleration. That was the rate at which velocity changes. The same is true for angular uh, or rotational motion as it was for linear motion. Here we're going to use another Greek letter. We use alpha. So it's kind of the fish symbol here. And that's how the uh, 
the angular velocity changes with respect to time. Angular velocity was radians per second. So we'll do how many radians per second we change by for every second, which gives us units of radians per second squared. And last one, time. It doesn't matter whether we're moving from place to place or whether we're spinning. We measure time exactly the same way. So there's no change here. Time in seconds, just like it was before. We'll draw that same analogy with the kinematics equations. So with linear, we used v's and a's and x's. With angulars, we're going to use omegas and alphas and thetas. The equations, though, are exactly the same. There's no difference here. So for the uh, v equals v naught plus a t, we'll write that as omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. So all that's changed is my variables. The next one will have theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. And the last one will have omega squared equals omega naught squared plus two alpha times the quantity theta minus theta naught. Uh, your equation sheets for the AP test, for whatever reason, they give you uh, the first two equations, but not the last one. So I suppose you probably can count on not needing to use this equation, really, but hey, we have the kinematics equations. We might as well know all three of them for both angular and linear motion here. Uh, so we, we set things up exactly the same way we did with linear motion. Uh, so probably a good idea to write down given information first and decide on an equation and plug things in and solve. There is one thing that, that can be a little tricky with these, and that's that we might have a combination of linear stuff and angular stuff given to us, or maybe they ask us to convert something. So like a wheel that has a certain radius rolls to a stop over this distance, and we're looking for angular quantities, like how many times it goes around, or you know, what's the angular acceleration. So we need to do a little bit of work with converting between the linear system and the angular system. So here we have this object that's going to roll across the horizontal floor. Uh, one phrase you'll see with these is rolls without slipping. So the idea there is that uh, you know, however far it goes, that's how much of the surface of that, uh, of that circle has been in contact with the floor. So we're not slipping past here, you know, not making any progress, but having different parts of the wheel contact the floor. Um, so uh, like if you accelerate too fast and your wheels squeal, that's not the situation we're looking at. So no squealing wheels in, in these problems. Uh, let's look at the relationship between angular motion and linear motion. So I put a little mark on this circle so we could tell where it starts, and I'm just going to put a mark right here to indicate that on our, uh, our drawing. And then I'm going to try and rotate this freehand, which might be a little tricky, and we'll go through one revolution of this circle. Oh, circle's getting a little bigger and smaller there. Oh my. Well, hopefully you get the idea. Probably not going to deal with a wheel that changes sizes in reality, but hey, what can you do here? And we end up at this new position right here. Now that distance, if our wheel doesn't slip, that distance has to be equal to the circumference of that wheel. So we go around one time to get from the starting to the ending point. So this distance is the circumference. Okay, so we made one revolution of this circle. And now if we look at uh, linear motion, the distance that we've traveled here, the x minus x naught, this, x minus x naught, that's the distance we've traveled, is equal to the circumference. That'd be 2 pi times the radius of the circle. And if we jump over to angular, the distance that we've traveled, here we're not really looking at a distance, but rather an angle through which we've traveled. So I'll write that as omega minus omega naught. So I'll write that as theta minus theta naught. 
And for one complete circle, we go around a, a distance, an angle of 2 pi radians. 2 pi, and that is in radians. Radians are kind of a funny unit. Sometimes they appear out of, uh, out of nowhere, and sometimes we have to make them disappear to make our units work out. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of play around with the radians a little bit as we go through this stuff. Um, but uh, 2 pi radians for one complete circle. And then let's just assume that we start at a position of 0 in both systems. So then I could write this as x equals 2 pi r and theta is equal to 2 pi. And I'll just leave out the radians for now. Uh, so we see these are very, very close together to, the, uh, to being the same equations. We've got x is exactly the same as theta. It's just multiplied by a factor of r. Now once you have that one figured out, you can go straight to, uh, to the velocity equations. Uh, so if we uh, just divide both sides by time, we end up with our uh, uh, position divided by time. That'd be a velocity. Theta divided by time, or change in theta divided by change in time, that's equal to our angular velocity times r. And the same thing happens with acceleration. We get alpha times r. So these three equations can be used to relate linear and angular quantities to each other. Um, now, I, I don't actually memorize these ones. I just uh, um, know that you know, 2 pi r is the linear quantity, so that's the circumference of the circle. The angular quantity is just 2 pi, so to get from the angular one to the linear one, I have to multiply the angular one by a factor of r to get this. So angular times r gets me a linear. And it works all the way down. The angular quantity times r equals the linear quantity. The angular quantity times r equals the linear quantity. Those equations aren't given to you on the uh, equation sheet for AP Physics, so I would either be able to derive those or you know, have them memorized um, you know, in case you have a problem where you've got both of these things um, being asked for. Um, but you know, really, it just arises from knowing that going around one time is equivalent in a, the linear system to going a distance of one circumference, or in the angular system to going an angle of 2 pi radians. And we derive this relationship. So now let's look at an example problem where we have rolling and we have to deal with both these systems and we have some kinematic stuff to do. Okay, let's tackle our first rolling problem. We've got linear motion. The ball moves from place to place, down the ramp in this case, and rotational motion. It's not rotating to begin with. It is rotating at the end. So both of these things need to be accounted for. Uh, a good place to start is writing out what things we know here. Um, and I would divide this up by you know, whether it's linear information or angular information. So for linear, let's say it starts at a position of 0, so x0 is 0. The final position then is going to be 0 0.10 meters. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, that's not correct. The final position is going to be 2.5 meters. 2.5 meters. There we go. 2.5 meters down the slope. The radius is 0 0.10 meters. Radius equals 0 0.10 meters, and that's going to be kind of a bridge between our angular stuff and our linear stuff. Uh, let's see, time is 4.0 seconds. And it says the ball starts from rest, so I can say v naught then is 0. On the angular side, I can set my starting position again, omega naught equals 0. Sorry, that's not omega, that's theta. Theta naught equals 0. Uh, omega naught, the starting velocity, that's going to be 0 as well. It's at rest to begin with. Uh, I don't know what my final... Uh, position or final angular velocity are going to be. In fact, I'm looking for my final angular velocity. I do know that time will be 4.0 seconds. That's not dependent on which system we're looking at. Um, and yeah, it looks like we're, uh, we're about there. Um, so over on the, the linear side, I don't know final, I don't know acceleration. 
on the angular side. I don't know the final angular velocity. I don't know the final position. And I don't know the angular acceleration here either. You can work in either system for uh, the beginning part of this, and we'll convert using that radius at some point. Um, so you could figure out, for example, um, what the final velocity is here, and then use that to calculate the uh, final angular velocity here. Do your conversion is your last step. Uh, since we've had plenty of practice with doing the, the linear stuff, we might as well make our conversion early on, and uh, or any conversions we need to, and then use those to uh, do the kinematics with angular equations. So let's make sure first that everything we know in the linear side, we can know in the angular side as well. It looks like we don't know the final position for the angular stuff. So let's go ahead and make that conversion using the equation x equals theta times r. So we've got our x value, 2.5 meters, is equal to theta times the radius, 0 0.10 meters. And so we'll get a theta here of 25 and that's radians now. Okay, so 25 radians. And then if you look through the equation sheet, there actually isn't an equation that has uh, the, the four known values that we have in this, uh, in this situation and omega in it. So we actually have to do two steps here. Let's solve for the angular acceleration first, and then we can use the angular acceleration to solve for the angular velocity, the final angular velocity. So angular acceleration, we can use uh, the equation that says theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Our theta here is 25 radians is equal to zero, our initial angular position, plus initial angular velocity is zero as well, so zero times t is just zero, plus one half times alpha times 4.0 seconds, and that gets squared, and then 25 radians is equal to four squared is 16 times a half, so that's eight seconds squared times alpha, and so our alpha value then is going to be 3.125, and the units on that are radians per second squared. All right, and then last step, we need to figure out our final angular velocity. So we can do omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. So that's going to be 0 plus... 3.125 radians per second squared times our time was 4 seconds. And so we're going to get an omega of 12.5 radians per second. So again, this isn't the only way that we could have set this one up. We could have found this uh, uh, v here, uh, I've done everything on the linear side, and then waited to make our translation from linear to rotation, or to rotation here, um, until our last step. So, you know, we would have done the, kind of the same process. Acceleration first, and then find the final velocity, just with linear stuff. And then we do our conversion as our last step. Um, so, anyway, multiple ways to do these problems, but you'll see they, they look pretty much like the kinematics we've done in the past, just with some funny-looking variables this time. Be careful on the units as well. Um, sometimes they'll give you revolutions per second for uh, an omega value, so make sure that gets changed to radians. There's two pi radians for every revolution, so you can make a pretty quick conversion there. Uh, but other than that, these look about the same as what we're used to. Thanks very much for watching. If you found this useful, please share it so other people can find it useful as well. Like it so people can find it more easily. And if you think the future videos will help you out, subscribe to the channel. Thanks again.